Okay, so I got this uh, from this book called Sacred Marriages, The Divine Human Sexual Metaphor from Sumer to Early Christianity. Now, I actually don't have this whole book. I just have one chapter. So I suppose that early Christianity part is probably from uh, Catholicism, I would imagine, with the uh, eunuch priests. All right, so chapter three, Sacred Marriage and the Devotees of Ishtar. There's a few things I've highlighted that I just want people to be aware of, so I can't sit here and read all these books. I have tons of books and papers and academic literature about this topic, all right? It's pretty well documented. We were never told this kind of religion existed, really. You know, you may have heard of fertility cults and stuff, but you thought they, like, those are things that they did a long time ago. But these things still exist, and these people control mass media and the government and the economy, These are Freemasons, all right? That's really what we're talking about here. Sacred marriage in the ancient Near East, which is where this, this is, that's where this has led me, by the way. It's all the ancient Near East and the pagan religions, all right, that are still being practiced. The religions that the Israelites, they were surrounded by these people. And sometimes the Israelites, in fact, quite often the Israelites would actually join them in their worship of pagan gods, which you can read about in the Old Testament, and that really pissed off Yahweh. That's what divided the kingdom of Israel originally. Solomon started to worship the pagan gods. The Sodomites were in the land. Sodomites were transvestite pagan priests. And that's what divided the kingdom. And it still has not been put back together yet. Sacred marriage in the ancient Near East usually refers to ritual enactment of the marriage of two deities or a human and a deity. Sacred marriage between the goddess Ishtar and several of her devotees. Now, this is the goddess of America as well, all right? All the symbols you see regarding the United States revolve around the goddess Ishtar. Go to Washington, D.C. There are thousands of statues and images of gods and goddesses. It's not just because they think they look nice. It's not just decoration, all right? It's a religious city created from nothing And in fact, it's not part of the United States, is it? United States, there's 50 states. District of Columbia, Columbia is the name of a goddess, by the way, right between Mary Land and Virginia, Virgin Mary. It's really just Ishtar in disguise. And it's not a state. Therefore, the district of Ishtar is not part of the United States because it is not a state. It's the ruling district of the slave states. All right, the United States is controlled by a foreign entity with foreign gods. Sacred marriage between the goddess Ishtar and several of her devotees, namely Asinus, Kurgarus, and Kululus. All right, so I think I've mentioned these things in another video, a previous video I did a few months ago. So these are basically the Babylonian terms for sodomite or male cult prostitute that you see in the Bible. All right, Assyria all these places, right? And then this moved into Greece and Rome and Washington, D.C. and Hollywood and all over Europe, etc. In their ecstatic performances, they were joined with Ishtar in a union comparable to sacred marriage. Actually, the devotees did not enter into regular marriage. The goddess they served was the only woman in their lives. Self-partnered by serving the goddess, they fulfilled the same function as the king in the sacred marriage ritual. They ensured the blessing of the goddess for the country. For all these reasons, the relationship between Ishtar and her devotees can be interpreted as one form of sacred marriage. In order to understand this relationship, one must examine the ambivalent gender of these devotees. Ah, like the OA, the fact that they were men who were changed into women, enabled them to join with the goddess on a level that no ordinary man could have achieved. (laughs) All right, so he stars the goddess of love and war, balancing the polar opposites, kind of like Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot was served in the uh, Israeli military, was also a beauty contestant. Ishtar did not conform to the expected role of a woman as a wife and mother. Ah, like the feminist movement, But on many occasions, she acted as a man. She stands at the boundary of differences between men and women. Her astronomical manifestation was Venus, which was considered to be masculine as the morning star and feminine as the evening star. Ishtar was worshipped as a lovely maiden, but also as a bearded warrior. 
And by the way, the, Egypt also has some uh, androgynous gods as well. Ishtar was not a hermaphrodite, but a female deity to whom male power and dominance were also attributed. All right. Now, you may see different uh, opinions about that particular statement, but there's a difference between hermaphrodite, which is a physical characteristics, and an androgynous deity. And the feminine aspect is the uh, fertility part of it, that they believe this, uh, you know, the mother goddess is the one that gives life to nature itself in your crops, in your, your family, and all these things. So it was a very important goddess that they wanted to serve. And then it also had these male attributes as well, and sometimes divided into the, a separate male deity, such as Baal and um, Astarte or Asherah, Ashtoreth. And in fact, Christmas uh, originated as the Asherah pole, which was a tree that was cut down and decorated. And the transvestite priest would uh, castrate themselves or someone else would castrate them and they would put the, the castrated balls under the tree to fertilize the land. And that was on the winter solstice. And then nine months later in September would be harvest time. All right, so that's the origins of Christmas. And you also put the, uh, the old pentagram on top of the tree and decorate it with balls, right? Those uh, things, those ornaments. A goddess of paradoxes. Harris also notes that Ishtar was a fundamentally liminal figure, marginal, ambiguous, marginal, and androgynous. She crossed the boundary between genders, kind of like they do in Hollywood and Washington, D.C., and all around the world, in order to unite with the goddess, her devotees discarded their original masculine identity. Ah. All three groups of cultic functionaries were born as men. Now, they were not hermaphrodites. See, sometimes these scholars, they just have trouble wrapping their head around this thing. Because it's so weird, right? They think, oh, maybe they were born hermaphrodites. and that's No, they were fucking trannies, man. Their appearance was either totally feminine or they had both male and female characteristics. Kugarus, Asinus, and Kluus are all recorded in the literature of the Sumerian period, and all three continued to appear in Akkadian texts up to the Seleucid and Persian eras. All right, so in the, uh, there's, a, there's an ancient um, story called the descent of Inanna into the netherworld. Ishtar, or Inanna in the Sumerian version, descends into the netherworld, which is uh, Sheol, in order to gain dominion over the kingdom of the dead. When Inanna fails to return, both humans and animals lose interest in sex, and no new births occur. All right, so Inanna's, the, the, the fertility goddess, is stuck down in Sheol, or the netherworld, and then no new life can happen on earth, right? So they got to get Inanna out of the underworld. In the Sumerian version, Enki, which is a different god, Enki creates Kugaru and Kalaturu to rescue Inanna. What are these? These are the Androgyans. The Androgyans rescued Inanna. This is like a sacred thing in their religion. This is a big deal. It's hard for us to understand it because it's weird. Somehow, this means a lot to them. <laughs> They're trying to change the whole world into a Kugaru to rescue, maybe Inanna needs to be rescued again. I don't know. But this is what's going on. In the Assyrian version, Ea creates transvestite priest, an androgyne, the original androgyne. In addition to demonstrating how closely connected Asinus, Kugarus, and Kulu'us were to the cult of Ishtar, the myth also provides justification for their existence and activities. They constituted a link and mediated between myth and everyday life. This provided them with divine power to carry out mythic, sacred actions in real life. Their duties and rituals consisted of ecstatic dance, music, ritual, plays. This is like 4,000 years ago. All right, these days we call it television. They dressed up as women and wore makeup. <laughs> yeah, it's as simple as that, really, right? They could dress up like women back then. They didn't need surgery, all right? It's not about surgery. It's about role playing. It's about playing the role of the opposite sex. It's about rescuing Inanna from the underworld so that life can continue, because that's what they believed. That was their God. They did not believe in Yahweh. They had to cut their balls off so their God would pay attention to them, all right? That's what kind of religion these people have, and that they're trying to push on young people today, and in fact, adults as well. Adults are probably more brainwashed than children. Cultic performers is probably most, oh, there you go. That's what an actor is, all right? Hollywood actor is a cultic performer. 
They walked in front of Inanna with women's clothing on their left sides and men's on their right. Well, these kind of things are happening today in the gala, all right, the Met Gala. Celebrities are actually wearing this stuff exactly today. Ritual self-mutilation, you can read about that. That's in the Bible quite a bit as well. And you don't make the connection, right? Unless you study this stuff out. You don't realize what's going on. Book of Jeremiah, there's tons of verses. The devotees use these techniques. Okay, devotees, modern day people are doing this as well. All right, the androgynes who in Freemasonry, the people who control society, are using these techniques in order to reach an altered state of consciousness in which they could achieve union with the divine, a sacred marriage. This practice is also widely attested in other cultures. For example, the Gali priests, there it is right there, the Gali priests of Greece and Rome, of Sybil, the Hedras in India, they still exist today. They worship the mother goddess. Jewish mystics, ah, that's right, Jewish mystics, Islamic Sufi mystics, and the shamans in Northern Europe. Ascetical effort, complete absorption into the divine. The ascetics resemble the boundary-breaking devotees of Ishtar. Their ambiguous gender role appears to have been represented by the word sinisanu, literally meaning woman-like, connection with an asinu. The devotees had a sexual role as well, sexual duties in the cult of Ishtar. So yeah, they were, you know, they, like in some versions of the Bible, it says... Uh, male cult prostitutes. Well, that's that's part of their role. Yeah, that's one thing they did, and they would make money for the temple and for themselves, just like the Hydra do today in India. They're both priests and prostitutes, all right? But it wasn't the only thing they did. They, they sang, and they danced, and they acted. And they worked in the government as well. There were prophets. Actually, I actually have a book that has uh, actual prophecies and poems written by these Asinu. Kugarus and Asinus also participated as actors in a ritual that was, that was possibly aimed at a sexual rival. The devotees sometimes participated in same-sex relations. It meant touching the goddess through her earthly representative. Yeah, you can see all this acted out on Netflix today. Asinu. Asinus are the best documented. Devotees of Ishtar from Sumerian times until the Neo-Assyrian period. Their gender is definitely ambiguous. Ursal means a man-woman, literally dog-woman. There's other uh, verses in the Bible that talk about the uh, price of a dog and stuff, and you wouldn't notice that these are references to the transvestites. The Asinus can also be viewed as purification priests. Some Asinus were prophets. There is a clear connection between ambiguous gender and prophecy. Kugarus, 2000 BC, according to Will Roscoe. Now, that's the paper I showed you guys before. That's a really excellent resource. The rites of Kugarus were aimed at first provoking divine fury in the form of ritual chaos or liminality, and then resolving it. The dance accompanied by music probably involved bloodletting, possibly in a trance. That's why they have this thing with blood. It's all connected, all right? Kulu'us, or galas in Sumerian, were originally chanters of lamentations, all right? Lamentation singers, all right? Like Lana Del Rey, 3rd millennium B.C., Singing lamentations was originally a task for women who were slowly replaced. Although the male singers, the galas, replaced women, they maintained the female forms of the profession and adapted their gender identity accordingly. Ah, there's evidence that the galas may have been engaged in same-sex relations. The best-known evidence is the Sumerian proverb. When the Kalum priest wiped his anus, he said, I must not excite that which belongs to my lady in Nana. That's the only hole you got, down there at least. The negative attitude toward the Gaulas is also reflected in the term itself, which was written using the signs penis and anus. All right, kind of puts things in perspective in a nauseating kind of way. In the Sumerian period in general, they had high social status. They still do. In fact, they're in the White House right now as we speak. Right next to the obelisk, the chief Gala had a high rank among the officials of the city. And there may also have been guilds and families of galas. <laughs> Possibly even female galas. Guilds, all right? Freemasonry and families of galas. Families, all right? I've shown you these things over and over again. This is happening now. It's happening today. Here's a book called Prophets and Prophecy in the Ancient Near East, Writings from the Ancient World. <laughs> and actually, this book has some 
writings from about 4,000 years ago, the Mari texts. They found a bunch of uh, ancient writing in the uh, Ugaritic culture of ancient Assyria, which is actually written about quite a bit in the Bible. They were basically the enemy of uh, Israel, were the Assyrians, all right? And the priesthood of the Assyrians were these things here called the Asinu, a man-woman whose gender role has changed from man to a genderless person, appears in prophetic function, all right, the undefinable sex of some Assyrian prophets. They actually found some writings by the transvestite priests of Ishtar. So they actually have the name of a transvestite priest, a person named Celebom, the Asinu, the demonically possessed transgendered pagan priest for the cult of Inanna. The Asinu delivered to me an oracle. Okay, so this is just a list of uh, the food rations of the prophets, prophetesses, and the Asinus of the Ishtar temple. All right, so we got the temple, we got Ishtar, the androgynous deity, we got the male prophet, we got the female prophet. Oh, what is this thing here? It's an Asinu. Okay, now here's some kind of uh, neo-Assyrian lexical list bunch of uh, cultic personnel, all right? So you got the lady, the high priestess, the priestess, the tabooed woman, the temple woman. You got the man woman, the kugaru. Now, could this have been a woman man? That's, I'm just wondering, you know, we got to look into this more. We got the hairy one. We got the hairy potter. And then we also got the hairless potter. Purification priest, cult functionary, high priest, exorcist, and just the regular exorcist, snake charmer, chanter, chief chanter, lamentation singer. We got the singers, right? The entertainers, the dancers, the wailers, the prophets, the frenzied one, and the man and woman back again, the Kugaru and the Asinu. The role of the Kugaru is analogous to that of the Asinu, who at Mari sometimes appears as prophet. Both groups have a permanent third gender role given by Ishtar directly from the goddess itself whose devotees they are. Well, it's the same thing going on today, all right? And here you go. Some more devotees of Ishtar, all right? They control the mass media. We got ourselves an Asinu, all right? An Asinu lamentation singer. Oh, you got the fake hips and you're crossing the legs. That'll make you look like a real female. No, you look like a fake female, all right? In fact, you look like Cher, the highest paid actress in the world in 2010 and 2014, chosen as People's Most Beautiful Woman, Times 100 Most Influential Asinu. Oh, it's an Asinu wearing makeup, deceiving the whole world. All smoothed out, tons of makeup, brow bones. Remember, it's all about the bone structure. If you're new, you got to find my old videos to where I talk more about the bone structure. Now I'm talking about the Asinus, all right? Oh, but they took the hair off, right? And they kind of oil them down. They kind of, oh, look at that, Adam's apple. You could say that's part of the bone structure, right? And then you got the big male skull. And of course, lots of makeup. And the smile, you got the smile. And you got the strong arms, right? Look at the upper body strength in these people, all right? Stop looking at their fake boobs and look at the upper body strength in that Adam's apple, all right? That's male, that's masculine, all right? That's an Asinu, right there in the red dress with the red lipstick. What's Tina Turner's real name? Anna Mae Bullock. That's right. What's a Bullock? A castrated male bovine animal of any age. Uh-oh, wait a minute. In British English, in North America, a young bull, uncastrated male bovine animal. Well, I'm confused. Is it castrated or not? There you go. Here's in a classic Asinu right here. Doing the old uh, Ishtar horn. <laughs> the phallus. Whoa! It's a, uh, that's one of those family show things with all the gay people on it. Look at that. You got the orange lipstick matching the orange dress. Orange. One of their favorite colors. All right. Now I was going to look at this one here. Ah. Who's, is that a man or a woman? I just can't tell anymore. Very androgynous. Genderless. Yes. Wear the pink. FTM's wearing the pink. There you go. Some more bones there. There's some upper body strength for you. Skin and bones, right? Lean. Women have higher body fat than men. This person has no body fat. Skeletal frame of a boy. Just wearing makeup. All right. Avengers, Stranger Things. All right. These are all about the occult. That's like the most masculine looking person you're going to see. 
besides pink. Yeah, it's all genderless. It's completely genderless event going on here. Oh, look. It's still genderless, right? Still genderless. They balance the polar opposites. There you go. That's as close as you're going to get to having a real phallus there, buddy. Now, this guy I've seen in real person, he's like four feet tall. It's just a horrifying thing. There you go. Grab onto that thing. You don't have yours anymore, do you? Maybe you do. We don't know. Look at those things, man. Whoa. Normally, you think they try to hide that a little bit, right? So they're coming out. Mass- now, think about this. We're looking at screens all day long now, right? Whether it's your iPhone or your iPad or your computer, whatever it is, you're looking at a screen. Most people are looking at a screen all day long. And what are they looking at? They're looking at the Asinu right here. They're looking at the transgendered abomination. Oh, yeah. Come on. The hard body. <laughs> Look at those arms. Come on. Whoa. Oh, there's one. Ah, see, that's what happens when you don't cross the legs. Looks pretty masculine. Oh, look at this one. Oh, nasty. They're getting larger. Yeah, there you go. Give us a sign again. Oh, here's one crossing the legs. Ah, yes, that'll deceive you, right? It's all feminine clothing and fashion. You just can't stop doing that, can you? This is a sorcerer, all right? It's a wizard. Those eyes, heart of stone, will turn to clay. 